Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day three in our series of webinars. Today, we are very pleased to have Simon Williams here from Rutgers, who has kindly stepped in for Sam Evans today, who had to drop out due to catching flu, and we wish him all the best and a speedy recovery. We also have Josh Moore and Connor Solms from Net Control, who will be here to help out with the questions and answer at the end of the talk. Simon is a consulting systems engineer for Rutgers, and today Simon will be taking you through the current and future technologies involved with Wi-Fi 6, 6E and 7, and what they mean for your school's wireless networks. Welcome, Simon, and it's great to have you here with us today. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to you. Brilliant, thank you. And um, so, uh, thank, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate your time. We're going to have a look now at um, Wi-Fi 6, 6E and Wi-Fi 7 in terms of considerations moving forward, particularly in view of making investments today to future proof for many years to come and what impacts Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7 have to these, these, these actual networks. I think you've got the slides up now, so away we go. So I'll take you for a bit of technology and then just through some considerations to make and, and things to think about when, uh, when planning your investments. Um, yeah, over the next sort of 40, 50 minutes, uh, we're going to be presenting to you, but do use the Q&A panel or the comments panel for uh, passing questions back. Uh, my, my net control colleagues are, are here as well. So Josh and Connor will be there to uh, answer questions from the partner point of view. I'm Simon Williams again. I work for Ruckus Networks, sort of active around the UK with a group of uh, systems engineers who help uh, put together solutions for in wired and wireless networks. Um, the webinar is being recorded as well. So, um, so you'll be able to watch that back if you uh, miss anything or have colleagues that want to want to watch it as well. Here we go. So what we're going to cover, really, so we're sitting in, a, in an area where Wi-Fi 6 has become very popular and is, is, is the go-to for any Wi-Fi purchases today. But there are other, others coming along, others available and others coming on. Wi-Fi 6E is out. We'll describe the sort of updates on what Wi-Fi 6E gives you over and above Wi-Fi 6. And, of course, uh, lots of stuff in the press, in the tech press, about Wi-Fi 7 and what that's gonna do for you and when that's gonna come along. So again, we'll talk about that. And we'll think about some other considerations, you know, some outside of Wi-Fi that uh, are important to look at when you're, when you're looking at the way forward. So first of all, how is Wi-Fi currently serving us? So this is, a, this is an interesting diagram in to, to start us off on the conversation. Um, there might be some surprises here, but I was just uh, looking at this slide a bit earlier on and it's actually depicting the, both the economic value of Wi-Fi in the marketplace today, which obviously is a huge number, but also looking at the various splits between different Wi-Fi um, versions that are around today. So if you look at uh, the bottom left-hand corner there, we've got the current Wi-Fi 6 sh shipments. So Wi-Fi 5 is still, there's still a lot of Wi-Fi 5 gear and earlier out there, but Wi-Fi 6 has certainly taken over in terms of shipments in the last few years. So you can see the numbers of numbers of uh, devices and indeed the numbers of access points that are, um, that are getting out there. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, Wi-Fi 6E shipments starting to happen with device both devices and access points and the important thing there as you'll see as we go through the presentation is it's often a case in terms of matching client devices that have a capability to the actual access points as well so there's a there's a theme running across that that particular one but as you can see here there the numbers are the numbers are massive and they're going to continue to continue to move forward so there's a, there's a wi-fi alliance um link there to go and see more details about that in terms of as we've come through the various different Wi-Fi versions, we've come through from the very, very early days that I unfortunately remember in terms of uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, A to 211B and G and N. You know, every release got a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. You know, Wi-Fi became much more important in terms of connectivity and the criticality of what Wi-Fi had to present as a service compared to maybe those earlier days when wired was still the primary option. But you can see we've come through to 802.11ac, which obviously had a wave one and a wave two. So that was getting to what we call VHT, very high throughput. Now, as we move forward and we get into maybe what they refer to here as the next 20, 20 billion devices, you start to look at some of the uh, newer aspects that have come along. So 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6, 
Um, from most vendors, that is the, uh, the, the version you buy these days in terms of active products. And we've then got the opportunity in terms of the, what the kind of extension to the Wi-Fi 6 capability, Wi-Fi 6E, that introduced in the, uh, you know, about two years ago or so, the six gigahertz band. So that was an introduction that we'll talk about you know, as we go through the slides of an extra band uh, up, in, up against the 2.4 gig and five gig bands that are available. Um, there's product out there with, with that and uh, different products available, which we'll talk about, but then that heads us into the, the evolution towards Wi-Fi 7. And you can see the, the name has changed slightly differently in the bottom right-hand corner there, extremely high throughput standard. So again, there's kind of a, it kind of points you to higher speeds, you know, speeds and feeds, but also a lot of, technology in there, a lot of features that are involved with packing more into the actual available spectrum. So being more efficient. So definitely we talk about higher speeds, but there's much more efficiency involved there, which gives us benefits as we, as we move forward as well. Okay, so let's have a, have a, have a, have a run through on Wi-Fi 6E briefly, just to uh, bring you up to speed on that if you haven't already seen things there. So Wi-Fi 6E added to 6 in terms of giving a new piece of spectrum that was available. And of course, spectrum depends, available radio spectrum depends on which country you are, you're, you're in in the world. So you have to check your local conditions. Obviously, in the UK here, we have uh, Ofcom, and we'll talk about them and their, their views here. Um, it's certainly in the UK and in, in the EU countries. There's basically a, a, a band of spectrum from 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 the 5.9 gigahertz through to the 6.425 gigahertz that gives us a whole load of extra channels that weren't previously available. So um, some of some of my marketing colleagues would put that in terms of you know, we're, we're adding an extra motorway to some already very congested roads in 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 Wi-Fi 2.4 uh, and, uh, and 5 gig. Um, so that gives us a huge amount of extra of extra spectrum, as you can see here in a summary of the various different bands, very little spectrum available relatively in 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, reasonable amount in the five gigahertz band that we'll talk about, but it's basically adding 500 megahertz to the six gigahertz band. So it's, it's adding quite a bit of capacity that will get us through um, some, some uh, 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 as um, bands start to congest. Uh, and it's interesting to note in the US, the US have taken the, the view on the full range of the six gig band for various different reasons. So over in the US, they've got uh, more than double the amount of uh, spectrum available, 1.2 giga, gigahertz of, uh, of spectrum available over there. At the moment, we're limited to the bottom section of that. So uh, that may change in the future, but, but currently we've, we've got uh, those, those channels available. Okay, let's have a look at what Wi-Fi 6E actually gave us. Wi-Fi 6 and 6E, I should say. So what Wi-Fi 6 gave us was a modulation technique using QAM that you might obviously be aware of from a technology background. That's how many, basically how many bits we can fit into the, uh, the symbols within the radio, within the radio frequency. So that's uh, 1024 QAM, which effectively has, has a direct rate, a, a direct link to how fast you can go across that radio link. So that's, that's uh, number one. Number two is there was an increase in the number of spectral streams you have. So within the APs where you have a number of spectral streams matching up with possibly a, a number of different clients and how many can talk at the same time or clients that can connect to multiple streams. And in Wi-Fi 6, we got to an 8 by 8 capability, an 8 stream unit was uh, was the maximum levels probably not used used to its maximum capability but with more extreme customers that are uh, that are trying to get access to more 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 capacity that that gave them more precision there we also introduced in wi-fi 6 uh, we introduced the use of ofdma so kind of taking some of the technology from the cellular um technology to again be able to multiplex more data in the download and upload areas into the uh, the available spectrum. So again, starting to look at more efficiency in terms of packing the truck, if you like, rather than the truck leaving half empty, we could actually pack in more users' data into that particular into that particular area, which was very important from the efficiency point of view. There was also uh, similar but different was the ability to do uh, multi-user MIMO. So that was the capability of having different users 
talking to the access point at the same time, at the same time slot, effectively. So it gives us, gives us again, some efficiency capabilities with clients that have that capability. We had something called BSS coloring. So um, the base station subsystem coloring, which meant you could actually um, stop interference from different networks where they were kind of maybe interfering with each other and um, actually uh, causing less efficiency between those networks. You can now effectively color them so that they're their own little domain, if you like. And that keeps those networks running, uh, running much more efficiently as well. Um, Tri-band operations, so six Wi-Fi 6E specifically bought in the six gigahertz band, so the addition there of the six gigahertz band, so that you've got the tri-band operation. And finally, the long OFDM symbol. So this, this is more appropriate to um, uh, uh, capability in outdoor deployments where you have a lot of multi-path, the signal bouncing across, across buildings. So again, it was uh, better to be able to have a longer OFDM symbol for devices to be able to sync up to then allow a slightly bigger payload as well. So great, great sort of utilization for outdoor deployments as well there. Okay, if we look at the bands, I'm sure you've, uh, within your, with your, in your schools and other environments, home environments, you've had a look at some of the free tools you can get to have a look at the, uh, the various networks that are around on your different uh, uh, 2.4 and 5 gig bands within your, uh, within your area. And what you'll find is a picture that's kind of very similar to this. So 2.4 giga, gigahertz band, you know, um, three non-overlapping channels that is severely congested in terms of all the various different devices trying to use that and uh, trying to use those those three non-overlapping channels and therefore obviously um, resulting in a lot of a very congested band there, which is where when five gigahertz came out uh, all those years ago as a, as a, as a very quiet band, uh, at the time, it was a good opportunity to sort of move clients, uh, certainly clients that are more um, that need more um, more throughput and um, capability. It was to move them onto the six gigahertz band. But what we're now finding is, that particularly driven by um, low latency applications, you know, high definition video and those kind of things, we're finding that that, that band is now getting more congested, and which gives gives us the great benefit of the six gigahertz band coming in. So, so those legacy devices, you still need to need to provide 2.4 gigahertz in many many cases because of legacy devices that are low cost and only feature 2.4 gigahertz. So, it might be things as simple as Sonos speakers or other low-end devices, IoT devices that primarily connect to 2.4 gig for reason of, um, of, of cost of device. But um, if you can spread these devices around those different bands, you get greater benefits. And of course, six gigahertz uh, adds to that. Adds to that. Okay, so what we have within that six gigahertz band, we have some, uh, some issues we have, to, uh, we have to deal with. And this is where, in, in the UK's case, uh, Ofcom, have some regulations that, that allow you to use that band for Wi-Fi connectivity uh, within certain constraints. And those, those the regulations will change again based on country. So what's currently existing in the six gigahertz radio band is a, particularly a lot of fixed microwave and satellite services that are obviously operating outside and, um, and uh, would prefer not to be interfered with. So the rules here are to make sure that you're not um, likely to interfere with different systems that already reside in those particular bands. So you can see the UK band that I was talking about that's, that's available for Wi-Fi is this uh, Uni5 band here. Um, in the US, they also allow you to go much further into these other bands that have various different services in them, yeah, some, some which are more critical than others and, and could be susceptible to interference from, from Wi-Fi. So the various different modes that you have in Wi-Fi 6 and also will happen in Wi-Fi 7 as the evolution of that is the power levels. So we have the opportunity to run uh, uh, 6 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi in either a low power mode called LPI, a very low power mode called VLP, or standard power. And what Ofcom tell us is that um, we have some restrictions in that we're allowed to run uh, low power devices as long as they're inside. So low power is, is, um, is, is relegated to inside locations 
must have an integrated antenna so it can't the, the access point can't have a specialist antenna antenna adapted to it it has to be an integral access point and they can't operate on battery power as well so stopping them from going going mobile effectively there's also a very low power devices so this is for for more mobile devices and very short distance communication probably think in the style of bluetooth bluetooth style uh, connectivity for local devices that that's okay to be run in in uh, indoors or out, out outdoors but at very 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 low powers um, there's also standard power. Now, standard power currently is not allowed from an Ofcom point of view in the, certainly in the UK, but standard power can be used for both indoor and out, outdoor locations in, in certain countries, particularly in the US right now. They allow the use of, uh, of indoor standard power. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that's uh, moving a little bit quicker in the US is, the, um, is, the, is the something called AFC, which is automatic frequency um, uh, frequency checking. I've got the acronym slightly wrong, but yeah, automatic frequency uh, um, congestion. Um, so what that actually allows them to do, that is effectively a server-based system that the FCC kind of overlook within the US. Currently hasn't yet been, yet, let been your, hasn't yet been launched, but what will, that will do for you is actually allow you to register outdoor access points such that they can be geolocated and can be approved for use outdoors to make sure that they're not interfering with other systems like the satellite and fixed wireless systems. So that's a specific system that has to be run where those access points will actually talk to the talk to the server every now and again and actually uh, report its location and, and, and verify that it's okay to transmit. But that is purely in the US at the moment, uh, Ofcom, have been looking at the AFC systems, but there's no no plans to implement that in the UK yet. So outdoor operation is precluded in the UK for for the for the time being, anyway. So that's the current current sort of um, regulatory regul regulatory requirements. So what Ofcom say? We put the link in there for the Ofcom documentation. So what they basically say in the ban that's approved for for UK and EU use, you're limited to a certain um, output power from the antenna of 250 milliwatts for the low power indoor and 25, 25 milliwatts for the, um, for the very low power. Um, and outdoor, outdoor deployments and mobile deployments are, are not permitted. So you can see we've got the, uh, the, uh, the power rates there for uh, use in the UK. Okay, and here's a comparison as well, just to give you the full picture, a comparison, if you compare US-based products with UK, you can see, again, they're allowed to have to run much higher powers. Uh, the standard power would, would actually be 36 dBm, so quite a relatively high power. And, uh, we are, and, and we are kind of restricted to slightly lower powers for our indoor use. Just going to pause there where I check that my, uh, yeah, my uh, microphone's still working okay. Yep. So that's a, a, a kind of run rundown of Wi-Fi 6E and the various different features and capabilities in 6E. Um, that's 6E, I, we kind of see it as a precursor to Wi-Fi 7. So Wi-Fi 7 is going to continue with that 6 gigahertz band and all the features we had in 6E, but then move forward with some newer features that add even more capability to the three bands, to the tri bands as well. So six gigahertz is just one of those one of those particular things. Okay, um, let's have a look at the timeline. So in terms of the uh, the 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 IEEE and the and the definition of a standard that obviously happens over many years within these Wi-Fi within these Wi-Fi environments, Wi-Fi six, uh, Wi-Fi seven, I should say, or eight hundred two point eleven BE. As, as the actual IEEE uh, standard. You can see there as we run through the various years that this has been going on, and we're currently sitting sort of, I guess, around about, uh, around about here, where we're still going through the draft process within the, uh, within the IEEE, leading to a final amendment that's probably moving into the 2024 sort of timeframe. So that's, that's where we currently sit in terms of uh, specifications. So obviously Wi-Fi 7 products that are coming out now are, are running to the draft specifications rather than final amendments. So they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, carry on, uh, they'll carry on being launched 
and we'll move forward as we move uh, move through the standards to get to the final drafts, which might have have various different uh, sort of hopefully minor changes to them. If we look at our view, this is this is a, a, a kind of purely a, 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 a ruckus marketing view, I should say, of a kind of timelining when things might happen. And we've started to get closer. In fact, we've, we've hit the start of when things are, are starting to happen on this uh, left hand side here. So in terms of Wi-Fi 7, one of the big things, one of the big shows that happens is the CES show in uh, Las Vegas at the very start of the year, which has just happened a few weeks ago. And that's obviously where vendors are going to be, particularly re retail vendors, uh, are going to be launching their products. And what we saw there was a number of routers coming from the likes of Netgear and, um, or TP-Link, I should say, and also um, one of our associated companies, Aris, in terms of their surfboard platform that is actually Wi-Fi 7 enabled. And they've been, they've been launched and you would have seen them at the show. So those kind of um, retail kind of versions of the products are, are, are starting to launch right now. In terms of clients, you start to see some of the clients launching as well. So um, as ever, Samsung are very upfront in terms of client launches and, and some of the other um, sort of Far East brands as well are launching Wi-Fi 7 uh, handsets and devices. Um, we start to see uh, something that, that hadn't happened in Wi-Fi 6E uh, heavily, but uh, Wi-Fi 7 is going to see Apple launching more products that is obviously going to drive the market forward. So kind of a potentially Q3 this year in terms of uh, an estimate of when uh, Apple might be launching, launching products. And what we can see from the AP point of view down here, we can see you know, potentially uh, enterprise access points starting to launch in the mid part of this calendar year. So first of all, um, certainly sort of uh, four stream units in terms of enterprise level and maybe moving to two stream units sort of towards the end of the, the, the quarter four, end of end of the year. So um, so you can see uh, maybe that's it. That's kind of a, a prediction on where things might happen ra rather than exactly where things happen. Also interesting to note that the AFC schedule in terms of this server in the US, the server capability for running outdoor six gigahertz services is, is realistically going to launch about Q1 so this, this calendar year. So only just starting to do outdoor services over there as we move through, um, through Q1. Okay, in terms of innovation, so what does Wi-Fi 7 bring you over and above Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E? So as I mentioned up front, it, you know, it does bring us some, you know, raw speed in terms of speed, speed and connectivity, which is going to be interesting in terms of driving some other things like wired connectivity of access points. But uh, what you uh, really are looking at is, is a lot of efficiency in terms of looking at real-time applications with time sensitivity networking, you know, enhancing uh, the OFDM capability that we'll look at, and even things like multi-link operation that we'll, we'll talk through. Talk through those some of those things briefly now. So, you know, in terms of raw speed, uh, and you know, of course, these are kind of mathematics-based numbers, physics, the, the laws of physics rather than what you might get, get from your actual device. But in theory, we're moving from Wi-Fi 6 maximum possible speed of 9.6 gigabits per second if you have a if you had a, the, all the perfect conditions to the capability within Wi-Fi 7 of a, uh, a dreamy uh, 46 gigabits per second coming in from access points now obviously that 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 those kind of speeds even if you half them and, and take a bit more off you're starting to uh, you're starting to even um, challenge some of our 10 gigabit networks out there today so again there's a there's a network conversation to have in terms of what is your um, what is your wide network capable of and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute a um, lot more of these things happening both in uh, I, I guess in education but also in out there in um, in research and development and production is augmented reality and virtual reality headsets uh, we saw a lot of these certainly within ruckus we saw a lot of these with customers dur during uh, covid where they were, uh, where um, people were limited in terms of their capability, in terms of uh, certainly in uh, in the um, in the pharma pharmaceuticals kind of uh, arena, where they uh, wanted less people in the labs, but wanted to be able to stream the kind of things they were seeing out to a whole lot of people on uh, Microsoft Teams. So a lot of uh, spread of uh, augmented and virtual reality headsets headsets for sharing information while 
while, while people are doing their, their, their job. So that points to a, an increasing need for time sensitivity networking on the, on the, on the wireless network. So the capability of adding uh, decent quality of service and uh, rate limiting and those kind of things on the networks. Um, the other thing we have is capability of multi-link operation as well. So multi-link where you're used to wired networks where you have things like ether channel and other things combining physical links together to be one link. You can do the same now in Wi-Fi 7 in, um, in Wi-Fi. So you can actually have a number of wireless links, you know, even split across different bands that will then allow you to combine traffic on those two bands for extra capacity, for resilience, for various other reasons. So it's so a great, a great, uh, great thing there in terms of uh, um, allowing maximum bandwidth and, and adding some resilience in terms of bands and, uh, and possible interference to, to bands as well. Other things that are in there in terms of uh, capability, it'll, it'll come out in different phases. So some of these things will be in, in, in first phases versus second phases, as you'll see. But some of the more, more important ones here, you know, physical enhancements, things like uh, wider channel width. So currently within uh, Wi-Fi 6 and 6E, 160 megahertz was the, was the widest channel. Um, what we're going to see net moving forward is the... Um, is the 320 megahertz channel. Obviously, the wider channel that you fit in a band, the, the less channels there are. So um, it does, does kind of preclude other things, but a, but a 320 megahertz channel can run a handful of those channels within the six gigahertz band. So for extremely high rates of uh, data across those bands, um, you, you'll be able to run higher channel widths. We've also you've got a basic increase in the, in the QAM uh, coding. So it moves up from 1024 to 4096. So again, a four times increase in, in, uh, in uh, QAM there that, that provides uh, quite a huge increase in, 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 um, in capable power or capable uh, throughput, I should say. Um, you also have um, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in the technology, you have something called preamble puncturing. So in terms of efficiency, one of the things you had is uh, a possibility that if you had interference in the middle of one of those very large channels, say you had a, a, a you know, in the best case, you had a 320 20 megahertz channel and there was some interference in, in part of the radio frequency band in the middle there, it would have to back off to a lower speed channel. With preamble puncturing, you can actually kind of spread the load across different channels that but keeping but puncturing you away from the uh, the interference so it just means that we can actually again pack more in where previously we would have to back off to a lower level of throughput in terms of uh, maybe finding some odd uh, uh, pieces of uh, interference on a particular radio channel so that's that's a useful feature as is multi IRE RU multi RU is the resource unit within the OFDM Multiplexing, it just means we can have clients running multiple resource units rather than having fixed ones. So again, efficiency in terms of how much we can fit in. And also moving from eight to 16 spectral streams. So probably more for the higher end users, but where you have 16 streams, maybe talking to 16 clients at the same time, moment in time, we can, we'll be able to do that on those, uh, on those operations. And of course, multi-link operation we just spoke about, you know, having, a, having client access point with multiple links on different bands as well, being able to multiple, multicast that traffic. But in other phases, you've got a whole load of other enhancements and things coming along that we won't dwell on today, but there's a lot of, lot of stuff to come, move forward as we, as we go, uh, go towards the future. We have a look at some of those uh, ones I mentioned. So first of all, the, the, uh, the physical enhancements. So the slides you also always like to see is more speed. So this is a comparison on this particular slide of going from Wi-Fi 4 to Wi-Fi 5 to 6 and 6E and through to 7. So again, what you can see there is just kind of a, a, a massive increase in the available bandwidth. You know, certainly if we go back to, uh, back, back to the 90s with, uh, with Wi-Fi 4 right the way through to where we are today, you know, 2.9 gigabits per second possibility with a, with a one stream device. Know, two stream and multi stream devices take us up to 46 gigabits per second in terms of the maximum theoretical capability on, on Wi Fi 7. So that's, that's, a, that's a great benefit. 
What we also get is um, a direct link use case. So certainly in, um, uh, it's, it's been around for a long time in some of the other standards, but the ability to use very low power, certainly in the six gigahertz band to actually be able to connect out to devices similar to kind of Bluetooth capability, but connect, connecting higher bandwidth devices between headsets, virtual reality and augmented reality headsets, direct printing, wireless displays, all those kind of things might do a very low power capability that actually brings us uh, into, into Wi-Fi 7, but actually gives us those that, that benefits of those short distance communications as well. Okay, just to move on to some um, some other considerations. So these these are kind of important. So we've we've talked about the nice uh, nice great technology, lots of increase in speed you see there. So one of the other considerations to have to, to be had there is about um, uh, basically how the access points and radio devices are, are attached. So um, here at Ruckus, we already have uh, a few Wi-Fi 6E access points. One of which has a 10 gigabit Ethernet interface on the back of it to be able to make full use of the of the capability. That's that's kind of point point number one. So point number one is you know is your cabling infrastructure ready for a, a massive increase in in uh, in, in um, capability on the on the Wi-Fi side? So certainly if you're if you're looking for new cabling or new new infrastructure and you want to future proof towards these kind of access points sort of moving forward then cat 6a is the go-to kind of standard cabling for these kind of wi-fi solutions so it's some, something to think about in terms of um in terms of what might be coming up um if we look at wi-fi 6 um 2.5 gigahertz um capability on wi-fi 6 um, was really the last one that kind of just about ran okay on on cat 5e cabling so cat 5e cat 5e cabling was was okay for that generally depending on distance but as you move forward into some of the other some of the other kind of uh, wi-fi 6 and wi-fi 7 you have to consider the speed of the connected connectivity from access point to switch that can then become the next bottleneck if you like so it's, it's worth having a having a having a consider of that the other part of that in terms of the wired side is the poe requirements so poe requirements um we spend a lot of time at ruckus trying to keep the poe low certainly in wi-fi 5 and generally in wi-fi 6 access points the uh, the poe is tried to keep below 30 watts of power and we have different modes to work where we can tone off various things to keep within poe plus at 30 watts which is the common poe across the uh, across many many different types of switches but of course wi-fi 6e and wi-fi 7 has taken us you know with a full capability with all that speed and power and efficiency and everything takes us over 40 over 30 watts up up into the 40s in terms of the requirements on poe so again it's another thing to consider when you start looking at these ap access points is to look at the power requirements of those access points particularly when they're when in, in view of the specification that you need in terms of what things that need to be turned on on the access points how many different bands how many radio bands how many streams and what impact is that going to have on the on the poe requirements so of course you need to look at your uh, your switches just to make sure that they they cater for those kind of uh, capabilities Next is the there's an, an eternal question we were asked um, about about Wi-Fi 6E. You know, um, as the slide puts it here, 6E or not 6E. So um, different views in the industry, and of course, as as, uh, as uh, education IT, you're going to be uh, marketed to on all sorts of different levels in terms of uh, access points and things. So so, so we took the few, took the view that uh, Wi-Fi 6 is uh is a great capability that's around at the moment uh, solidly available in in uh, from from a lot of vendors um very good performance uh, very good performance for for your needs if it matches the performance for your needs that that is great one of the things we saw with wi-fi 6e one of the phenomena were were a number of different issues uh, both practical and market issues so practical issues um when you look at certainly when you look at the six gigahertz band as I'm sure you all know from the difference between 2.4 and 5 giga, giga, gigahertz, is that the 5 gigahertz, just through physics, has a, uh, a shorter range, effectively. So when, you, um, when you're doing a wireless survey, you'll certainly be planning for 5 giga, gigahertz 
um, range rather than 2.4 gigahertz range, which, which has a longer range. Same thing slightly with the six gigahertz band as well. You have a two, two dB difference between five gig and six gig in terms of range. So potentially if you're looking seriously at, uh, at six gigahertz and what that's actually gonna give you, you might need to look at new uh, a, a new survey to be able to work out what six gig is going to give you in terms of range within your uh, your your locations. Um, uh, relatively minor thing: six EA, six EAPs could be seen as rogue a APs by some other APs in the market. So you might see them uh, see them uh, being tagged as, as rogue APs within your management systems. Um, end user adoption was the biggest thing. What we what we saw with Wi-Fi six E was a uh, limited adoption on the clients. Obviously, if you haven't got the clients to match the AP capabilities, you've got limited uh, requirement for Wi-Fi 6E. What, you, what we did see is uh, uh, quite a lot of device, or quite, quite a few devices in terms of high-end laptops with uh, six gigahertz capability. Um, particular types of phones, particularly Samsung and others had uh, or have phones with uh, six gigahertz capability. Uh, not, not very few, if, if any, Apple devices with with that six six E capability. So it's certainly seen um, by you know based on the evidence that six uh, E was a leaping point through to seven in terms of seven being the sort of more widely adopted client um, client standard. Which has uh, uh, which which um, people have made the decision on sort of waiting back for Wi-Fi seven for a for a, for a full deployment and an investment. And added to that is the no current plans for the uh, the, the 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 AFC the, the frequency um, planning for UK and EU certainly for UK under Ofcom. So no plans to allow outdoor access points running uh, six gigahertz band in the in the immediate term. So in, in the end, so that that, that kind of uh, relegated 6E to indoor only use at particularly low power. So again, kind of a, a judgment there based on the investment on, on what's required. Okay, so just coming up to the sort of uh, final slide, I suppose, and just in terms of wrapping up, just to uh, to wrap up the uh, various things and, uh, and uh, see what questions we've had coming in. So, um, so th what's the wrap up? The summary really is the, you know, there's new spectrum available and open in certain countries. If we, if we look specifically at UK, what we saw was there's a extra five megahertz of bandwidth in the six gigahertz band that's available for use. Um, so that's gonna be, um, that's gonna be nice and open and, and freely available at the moment uh, as, it's, as, as products come out. Um, so you could say six gigahertz is ideal for greenfield deployments where you're where you're uh, buying now. Um, mesh backhaul in six gigahertz became becomes interesting. So if you think about um, if you're doing a, a Wi-Fi mesh solution at the moment um, in six or even in Wi-Fi five, you're actually effectively using part of the six sorry part of the five gigahertz band. Sorry, you're using part of the five gigahertz band for the meshing between access points. And as well as using that for client connectivity as well, so you're kind of uh, you're getting a benefit of having wi wireless connectivity over your access points around a location, but you are using up bandwidth, you are using up uh, spectrum that uh, could, that could be used for clients. Um, six gigahertz becomes more interesting in terms of possibly being just a meshing link between access points. So that is a, that is a an idea where it could be used indoors in terms of an uncongested area where you could move your meshing links to and leaving the five gigahertz band free or for connecting to clients and so on and so forth. So that's that, that's very good. Um, looking at new sensitive applications, something that's gonna drive six gigahertz deployment. So again, the virtual reality headsets, the high, anything with high definition, um, high definition, high definition video, anything that's delay sensitive, certainly in terms of industrial capabilities, gaming, virtual reality, manufacturing, all those kind of areas are, are certainly going to be uh, looking for the benefits of those um, time sensitive applications as well. And finally, I, I guess a little note on the bottom here. I guess uh, we're all we're all marketed to, and everyone's going to have their latest and greatest Wi-Fi seven thing coming out. It's always always good to uh, obviously be aware from what hopefully what you've seen in the presentation so far that there are some obvious points there. That there are points of you know 
are, are there going to be the clients to match the capability of the access points and when's that going to happen? Does your infrastructure, does your wired infrastructure really release the capability of some of the newer access points as well? So that's an, in, uh, that's an, an investment choice as well, thinking of, particularly thinking of wired investments uh, pro, uh, potentially lasting longer than a, than a Wi-Fi investment as well in terms of uh, time frame. So, so a few things to, uh, to bear in mind there before making, making that leap. But uh, yeah, certainly Wi-Fi 7 is looking like the, the, the bright future for, for Wi-Fi as we move forward. So, so hopefully you've, uh, you've enjoyed that, uh, that webinar, just uh, uh, raising a few points there. I can see the comments clocking up here. So um, we'll go to some Q&A and see what, uh, what questions and answers we have. Yeah, hi, Simon. Thank you for that. So, yeah, we have a few questions come in. Um, so we've had one question come in with, with stretched budgets, full network refreshes are becoming impossible. What areas should be a priority? That's a, that's a really quite, that's a really good question. It's an open one. Um, <laughs> it's an open one. It is a very open question. It's probably the, uh, it's probably the one question that this, that this whole thing's raised. So thank, thanks. Uh, thanks, Randy. That's a great, great question. Uh, uh, Josh, I don't, uh, if you, you, uh, I don't know if you've got any, any points, but I think, um, obviously if you're looking today, Wi-Fi six is still a great investment. It's great technology. It's only, only been around, uh, only been around, you know, uh, you know, on the market for, you know, three or four years. I'm uh, kind of trying to thinking back. So it's it's certainly not a sunk investment. It's certainly a, and, and of course you know that Wi-Fi is uh, backward com compatible generally. So all the things we've talked about today, the clients can backtrack to Wi-Fi six and Wi-Fi five as, as as you'd expect. I think certainly you know with as you say with stretch budgets, it's six E certainly wouldn't be wouldn't be a, a good use of, of of any budget, particularly if they're stretched unless they're for specific applications. But I think seven, seven is the area where you're looking to next. But I think uh, genuinely it's looking at some of the capabilities that um, like speed and like efficiency and whether they're going to help you in your particular location or in your particular sort of area. So there's certainly, sort of, you know, uh, being aware that a Wi-Fi refresh might, have, might, might be coming up in three, four, five years time if you're looking a bit further out. Certainly, uh, look at the look at the uh, the access points first, and then look at whether the, whether your switches can can uh, can real you know genuinely realise the full benefit, or whether there needs to be a look at cabling and switches at the same time. Um, not always the case, so it's 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 kind of on a on a case by case basis on what what you really need, I suppose. But hopefully, hopefully you've been made aware throughout the presentation of, of the things you need to kind of consider. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I, as you kind of said, I think it is very much a case by case basis on this one. In um it depends where you are on obviously cycles budget availability uh, certainly we have had clients come to us asking about 6e and our initial advice has been looking at the network um you know do you have poe budgets to, to power it and sometimes that question has been no so it's kind of going back analyzing what you currently have and where investment is um certainly in high density areas if you've got a few of those perhaps more high priority areas they could be areas you focus on initially and then do a slower outreach um, I guess possibly the best advice is that you will have a no doubt aligned to a networking integrator, either for wired or Wi-Fi, to speak with them about what your plans are, your budget cycles, challenges right now, uh, and work with companies like NetControl and others ones that you're currently aligned to, because certainly they they'll be good to advise you on those next steps and look to something that's kind of fits your budget, your your IT strategy over that the next three to five years. Um, so cool. hopefully Thanks. that yeah. covers off Thanks, uh, that question. Again, it is, it's a very open question. It is very much a case by case. So I think um, it is just a case of uh, yeah, engaging with those that, um, that you work with. Um, so we've had another one. So, um, right. So when all clients are trying to uh, access, say, JPEGs around network, AC wave two throughput collapses. Um, is Wi-Fi six really any better under load? Yeah, that's a, that, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nick. That's a, that's a good question. I'm reading a little, little uh, further down because sometimes there's some, some more comments come. Really like a really good. Yeah, I think so. So, Nick, sort of. Um, 
it's 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 an interesting question, and it's and it's very subjective, I suppose, in 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 certain sense. The, the physics says yes, um, but what we've found, I mean, so we've certainly had uh, sort of recent recent uh, um, recent cases where you look at networks and uh, you you find that they they either they've been deployed in a in a in a slightly unusual met way. Which has led to clients operating very badly. I'm, I'm take, taking you at your word that it's in the it's in the um, you know AC wave to it's on the five gigahertz band. We have all sorts of things, obviously, as you guys probably all, all you folks all come across in terms of uh, you know placement of APs, um, cha- uh, band balancing between different bands in terms of clients sometimes preferring prefer, preferring 2.4 gig. Now that was a, and that was in exactly the same kind of situation in a in a in a photography class i think where there was a lot of files flying around all over the place between sort of 30 clients and you find that you know maybe it's a mixture of things that are causing those kind of kind of issues but but yeah the physics genuinely says yes and particularly when you go to wi-fi 7 in terms of time sensitivity and just being able to be more efficient with how we pack data into into the uh, into sort of various frames in terms of the multiplexing and the uh, the available spectrum that will show that will definitely show a real benefit in terms of those environments so yeah that 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 will show up just reading a bit further down uh, the network's increasing yeah also i mean i just i mean i know when um certainly when we go out to do surveys you can do kind of density planning as well with ap's to give some sort of um idea around uh performance capabilities of, of what it might be or what you might get um yeah mm. so nick was just adding that uh yeah they did have some engineers supervising uh from both aruba and aerohive um when they did their bake-off there yeah okay yeah yeah that's uh um, it's, it's it, like i said it's always good to as as uh, josh said it's always good to talk to your talk to your partner and um and get their sort of recommendations on on all those kind of things, placement and those those kind of aspects as well. Um, so another question: So, um, do you see the lifespan of networks increasing, like with phones and other technologies? That I, you know, what I can't answer that question. I I, I don't personally, but it's a good question. I'll pose that to some of our uh, our, our internal people and uh, see see what they. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's again another good question from Randy because. Uh, you know, things things move on, and I like your comment a bit earlier on about you know may, maybe wait for Wi-Fi eight. I'm sure that's the uh, that's the uh, that's the comedy comedy re- reply, I suppose. But uh, it's um, yeah, I don't I can't answer that. I don't know, Josh, with Josh or uh, Connor, if you've seen any, you, you, you certainly certainly. Oh, I, don't, the... I don't think I, I don't think I'm brave enough to. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's, I, it's, I think um... it's hard. I think what we see. Um, with IT budgets, certain education as they are, I think it is likely that we'll see the likes of Wi-Fi 6 certainly lasting longer. Um, I think Wi-Fi 6 was a big investment for a lot of schools and colleges. And certainly when we've been to assess sites, in terms of capabilities, it, you know, it's still doing a great job um, with Wi-Fi 6 e Wi-Fi 7. There is a big investment, not only in the access points, but reviewing your cabling infrastructure, the network infrastructure. So. I think actually there could be external factors uh, that maybe prolong lifespan of, of networks, and it could certainly in education down to that, um, yeah, the budget side of it. Yeah, and we, we've always seen, as, as, as per Nick's, Nick's comments there as well, you know, we've always seen certainly, so I've, I've originally come from the switching side, and you see, uh, you know, 10, 15 year, year old core networks and you know five five year old wi-fi networks and that's that's just uh that's that's a budgetary thing isn't it that's just that just that yeah. just, just happens so um but, i yeah, think we were speaking to someone else the other day who had some i think it was the two nine four twos uh these are the big the big do- ruckus domes i don't know if any of you <laughs> can remember those they look like the uh almost like the robocop helmets i think it was the two nine four twos i might be wrong with that <laughs> i can't remember all the yeah. um the other number code so um another question so are older standards such as bgn are being retired in the near future no another good question i'm not not that i'm aware of but of course you know we've we certainly have you know in, in the controllers for these kind of networks you certainly have capabilities of of turning off some of the older clients to uh, to free up sort of capability it's something again that came up in that scenario of the large moving large files around and congestion within a particular classroom 
of, of a number of plants that you sort of turn off some of the older some of the older capabilities in the controller to kind of free up yeah, and and let the the newer the newer capabilities kind of breathe a bit more. So, but no, uh, John, I'll have a look into that. Whether there's kind of uh, kind of uh, older standards being retired, there's a kind of a, obviously uh, uh, the obvious history of being backwards compatible. So that still that still continues with the sort of Wi-Fi alliance and all those all those kind of folks in terms of assuring backwards compatibility, which is obviously always good good when you're on a budget as well. So. So I think that is, I'm just scanning up the list to see if there's any questions that I've missed. Um, I don't think so. So I suppose we can leave that there just to see if any other questions came right at the end. But um, for those that are, oh, is there? Oh, well, there was, there's, there was a, oh, a question from there. Derek. Derek, Derek was asking about fastest throughputs. I think uh, gen, gen, generally we kind of, um, you know, as a, as a general rule of cut thumb, we kind of halve, you know, best case, we kind of halve those physics numbers that you've seen on there. So when you talk about 9.6 gig in, uh, in the, in the Wi-Fi 6 area, you kind of generally kind of rule of thumb going half in terms of actual sort of throughput capability that you're really going to get. So um, that, that's, that's what we kind of, kind of go for generally. Um, so we have had a couple of questions come in now. So uh, what is the standard support period for Ruckus APs? Uh, we're currently investigating costs or possible solutions to overhaul our existing network. Um, they have a campus-wide Wi-Fi provision. DFE technical guidance states five years to 10 years. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, another good question. I've got, I, I was just looking at a spreadsheet the other day, actually, of this kind of, of, a kind of the kind of history. Certainly, I think we've got a good, I think as a vendor, Ruckus have a good track record of supporting access points for quite a number of years. Uh, certainly, uh, if, you, if you look back, if, you, if you're talking of the five-year kind of end of that, there's loads of access points still supported. And still going back further than that, you're, um, you, you're still supporting those on systems, you know, being doing some uh, stuff on our, even on our enterprise controllers, some uh, you know, backwards compatible uh wi-fi zones that run older access points so we're quite flexible from that point of view um and similar on the switches if you look at the switching side as well we've got a, a great range of switches that uh have been uh, supported you know through a lifetime warranty for many many years so that's pro ho hopefully some of you out there with your 10 15 year wireless network wired networks are running some of the uh, ruckus or brocade uh, icx switches but and uh i think the only thing to add to that is um, the standard support is when it goes end of life, you give five years hardware support as limited lifetime warranty um, for hardware. Um, I think we've had a look before and software wise from release day is between the region of six to seven years support within controller. And then when they go end of life, um, software support ends or whatever firmware code that is. And then you've just got the hardware support after that. Yeah, so good, you do, good point. You Connor, technically so can, I think that does go to another question where someone mentioned about sweating assets. Um, we have had people, I think we've read before where they've said Wi Fi is typically changed with a five to seven year lifespan um, and switching in the eight to 10 year range. But we know that doesn't happen. Um, and we're seeing Wi Fi more closer to the eight, the eight year mark rather than uh, five to seven. So I think them two sort of linking together that Ruckus do allow hardware support for five years after end of life, um, whilst that doesn't include software. Cool. Thanks, Connor. Yeah, good point. Yes, I mean, that does cover off the other question there from Chris. So, yeah, with the supply chain issues uh, that appear to be affecting some vendors more than others, are you seeing customers being forced to sweat their Wi-Fi assets further than ideal? Um, certainly with... I know with our, I mean, I would say bar some switching models, I believe we have supplied every client that has been in need of APs over the last, certainly the last year and a half. Um, there are still supply chain issues. I think those seem to be more affecting certainly multi-gig switching across a number of vendors. APs we are seeing come through, get more available. So I think in terms of options to customers, there are now options, should budgets be available for them to look at. Um, so yeah, so I, I certainly the the stock issues we have had over the last two years certainly seems to be improving a lot. 
Um, there was a question. So regarding the support, uh, does this not conflict with the recommendations for vendor support or CE plus recommendations for vendor support? Uh, I don't actually know what the CE. No, I don't either. Actually, no. I was just Googling it. So I don't know if it covers off the question. So the support tends to be that the lifetime of the access points polis then once it hits an end of um, an end of sale notice, it's then five years from that point. So um, you know your AP might have seven year life cycle before it hits an end of sale notice. There's then the additional five years on top of that whilst it is supported. Oh sorry, they've added some more here. So um, so the device yeah, must be supported. So I'd have to have a look. I suppose I can respond to that later. If I look at the um uh yeah the cyber essentials recommendations and I, I can put a response to that in more detail i'll just look at the the recommendations is, is this um, a question about about security updates do you reckon josh i'm not I'm yes i mean chris has just said different. so the device must be supported firmware bias etc to comply and i think security updates are are separate this is um more related to uh controller firmware issues isn't that right but security i believe is Yes, yeah, uh, I know it's something we've been addressing recently in terms of requirements for security updates further into the end of life pr process. So I'll, I'll come back to you, Josh, on on, on that point, because uh, I know someone's looking into that at the moment. So in case the question's about that. <laughs> that's fine. So if that's OK with with you, Chris, that will we'll, um, I'll take that question away and I'll, I believe this is all becoming on the Edge Geek site. So I'll put a response to that in a, a more thorough response anyway for you on the forum. Um, okay, I'll again, I'll leave it from the minutes if there are any other questions. For anyone that is um, just, just further ahead, if there is anyone attending bets in March time, um, both Ruckus and Net Control both do have stands there. Um, so I think Simon will probably be there for a day or two. Have they, have they roped you in, Simon, yet? Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. We're all, there'll be one of our, there'll be at least two of our uh, sort of systems engineers on, on the stand during the three days of the show. Um, so yeah, come and come, come and see us. If you've got any any uh, any of those uh, technical requirements or questions, yeah, certainly come bring bring them along. And Sean and Chris have just mentioned as well. So obviously, Edgy will be there as well on the ICT direct stand. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you are at Bet, do come and see us. Say hi to Simon. Um, and also, if you do have any other questions about wireless networking, the future your options, please do let us know. And we'll we'll um, get back to you as soon as we can. And you say, um, Chris, I'll take that question away and I'll, I'll get that response on the um, on Edgy Geek for you. Okay, yeah. Thanks, everyone. I think that will wrap it up for today. Um, I'd like to thank Simon, Josh, and Connor for very much for joining us today. And it has been very informative. I've really enjoyed this.